little stories about any successes. You are successful enough. We want to get to the meat of your question. So have the meat of your question together. No introduction to nothing. Just the question. Malcolm X stated. Hold that door. Hold that door before you answer that. For those of you who want to take the pictures when we're done, have your cameras out because we're on a time constraint. We're going to do one line for the women, one line for the men. If you're a couple, you can choose either side. Biologically born men and women. Y'all got me? <laughs> <laughs> got my cell number. So if you're taking the picture, make sure you text me the picture so I have it from my archives. Go right ahead. Malcolm X stated that Pan-Africanism will do for black people what Zionism is did for the Jews. Your feedback. Well, I'm not too interested in what the Jews are doing. I think too often we worry about what everybody else is doing and we don't have a plan for ourselves, but I don't necessarily agree with what Brother Malcolm said as well. But we are not Zionists. We are not imperialists. We are not seeking to take over a country where God did not put us. We want where God put us, and that's Africa, the richest continent on the planet Earth. And the one thing I need people to understand about Pan-Africanism, we do not believe that everybody should go back to Africa. That is a lie. There was no such thing as a back to Africa movement. The Honorable Marcus Garvey never called his movement back to Africa. It was the white media that called it back to Africa. Marcus Garvey said, quote, some of you are no good in America and will likewise be no good in Africa. I have no interest in taking every Negro back to Africa. And I agree with Marcus Gall. Could you imagine if I showed up in Lansing with a big Noah's Ark and put every Negro on that ship and then took you to Ghana with your white girlfriends, your video games, your basketball, your take care, your Air Jordans? Do you imagine how much problems you would cause for our brothers and sisters in Africa? The only people I want going to Africa are people who have been able to reclaim their African mind. My question is, what can we do as a people to get these black churches to stop teaching white supremacy? I agree with you. The black church is teaching white supremacy, Bob. But our solution cannot be reactionary. So it's not about stopping the black church. It's about where is that other rival organization or movement that we need to create so black people are not even interested in going to church anymore. They come to us. The beauty of what Garvey did, the reason Marcus Garvey was more successful than every other black leader put together in terms of organizing is he's the only one who did not marry his movement to a religion. Everybody else married their movement to a religion. Some chose Islam, chose, some chose Hebrew, some chose Christianity. Garvey said, we have a church. If you want to pray to Jesus, go to church. Garvey said, we have a masjid. You believe in Muhammad Ibn Abdullah? Go pray in the mosque. Garvey said, this is a black man's movement. And the purpose of this movement is to nation build for African consciousness. We don't have to fight the church. We have to outwork the church. Uh, what do you think about, uh, I don't know if you follow the brother Dane Calloway. Who's I don't follow him. You he's, not, he's not teaching anything I'm interested in. Okay. Nor is he a scholar. He's a YouTuber. Okay. Go ahead. And uh, the thing that he's, uh, what he's come across with, with, with some of his studies that he showed and backed up. Uh, back he ain't up. backed that stuff up. I've seen it. That's not evidence, but go ahead, Bob. Okay. The main thing I want to say is, what, the main point he was stressing that, that, that as far as African uh, uh, indigenous people, we were already here. Thousands and thousands of years before any uh, white settlers. I agree with you, but you got to clarify. When you say we were already here, because I agree with that. We were already here. We have documentation of African kings who sent voyages to America way before Columbus. So we know we were already here. My issue with them is when they argue that America is a cradle of human civilization. Meaning, God put an original man on American soil like he did in Nile Valley, Africa. And that is completely false. How do we know that? There are six stages of modern man. The only place you can find all six stages are in Africa. The only stage you find in America is the most recent stage, which is us, Homo sapiens sapiens. 
If the United States is a cradle of civilization, where are the other five stages of modern man? The only place you find all six is Africa. Yes, we were here first, but we came from Africa. He is a self-hating Negro who don't like who he is and where he come from. And it's, it's bad, toxic teaching because instead of making black people embrace who they are, you're trying to give them an excuse to hate themselves. But I'm going to go a step deeper. It ain't even about whether he's right or I'm wrong. I can prove mine. He can't prove that. Here's the real issue, Bible. Put that to the side. Because I think sometimes we fight too much over the past while we're losing the present. And the white man in Chinese is taking a piece. So my question for him and anybody else, where are your schools you building for our kids? Where are your hospitals you building for our elders? Where's your supermarkets to feed our families? Where your jobs to keep black men out of prison? Because if you ain't talking about food, clothing, shelter, security, and health care, I don't care anything else you're talking about. It's a waste of time. I can say this also. The way I think this week, today, now, it could be totally different. A couple of weeks, a month from now. I've always had the opportunity of my mind to be expanded. Yes, sir. To receive the information. Yes, sir. Because as long as I got facts, I won't lose an argument. I'm not talking about no historical truth. I'm talking about historical facts. As long as I got it, if I can go and back and stand and back that up with it, mm -hmm. that's how I'm gonna roll. Mm -hmm. That's how we all should roll. But the main thing I like what you said here, the one last, last form of slavery, slavery, slavery that we gotta get rid of is that church. I agree with you, Baba, but here's the thing. I'm gonna go back to Garvey. Why did Garvey out organize everybody else? He out organized Elijah Muhammad. He out-organized Noah Drew Ali. He out-organized Dr. York. He out-organized the Hebrews. Garvey out-organized all of them put together. You know why? All of them went to religion. Garvey kept it with African consciousness. We have to be careful about attacking the church outright. We have to be strategic because black people are so religiously immature that if you tell them they have to put down Christianity or Islam, they are indoctrinated to cut you off. How are we going to save ourselves if we're pissing black people off and attacking their religion? I look at me. I have the largest following of anybody in the conscious community in the world. I'm the closest thing to Marcus Garvey in this day. And you know why? I don't attack religion. If they invite me to the church, I'll speak in it. They invite me to a Hebrew temple, I'll speak in it. They invite me to a masjid, I'll speak in it. I never attack people's religious beliefs because we can all put down the Bible and Quran today, but if we ain't got no institutions and power, what difference does it make? The church is a problem, but it is not the problem. The problem is the lack of organization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Omar Johnson, this is Deborah. Deborah Gilmore that I just texted you a couple days ago, remember, and we communicated. But um, I want to know, do you believe Jesus Christ of Nazareth is true and the Bible is true and do you believe in him that he was the Savior for all mankind? I believe that the Jesus of the Bible is a plagiarized story of an African mystical tradition mm. that predates it by 2,500 years, which is the story of Hebrew. Asaru, okay, and uh, all set. The original immaculate conception story, which comes out of non Bible spiritual tradition. The Jesus story of the Bible is a plagiarized story, as are most stories of the Bible. Remember, the Hebrews came into Kenya. They picked up the culture, they picked up the spirituality, they picked up the historical traditions, and out of the original spiritual traditions of our ancestors on the Nile Valley, they created Jesus. So there's truth in the Bible because the stories in the Bible are borrowed from African tradition. For example, the Psalms of David, there is irrefutable, pro irrefutable truth that some of the Psalms ascribed to the prophet David are actually borrowed and plagiarized from the Psalms of Akhenaten, who was King Tutankhamun's father-in-law. King Tut married Akhenaten's daughter, and some of the Psalms that they give David credit for came from an Egyptian pharaoh by the name of Akhenaten. So my issue is not the religion, just understand that a lot of what's in it was borrowed from a spiritual tradition that predated it by thousands of years. I'm not against Christ. I got a tattoo of Jesus right here, because I'm a Jesus too. There's been many Christ who have come. There will be many Christ who will come. The word Christ is not a name. It is a title, okay? And it comes from an African word, okay? Uh, 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 the, uh, it means the anointing. 
anointing of the Messiah. It's the word that speaks to the rising of the spirit. Yeah. Another one is quick. I mean, you don't believe any white man can help you or another black person on their on the journey to, to power black people. You don't you don't want to help from Listen to your question, Queen Mother. You said I do I believe any white man will help you. No, 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 no. I've never done nothing to white people. They enslaved me. They kill my children on the street. Anymore. They kill my birthday night. They incarcerate my brothers. I've never done nothing to a white man a day in my life. So don't make me the perpetrator and make him the victim. He's the victim. Excuse me, I'm the victim. He's the perpetrator. But here's the thing, please, brother. You keep on looking at this race thing from the lens of individualism. Listen to what you said. You don't think any white man. It ain't about no individual white man. It ain't about no individual white woman. What have white people done collectively and systematically to destroy their white privilege so black people are given a fair opportunity? That's the question I need you to answer. Have they ever done anything to eliminate white privilege? They never did and they never will. I'm not interested in demonizing white people because I don't believe you need to hate, but we need to accept our reality. And one of the realities that black people are in extreme denial about is the fact that white people are going to give us nothing. Anything we need, we got to give it to ourselves. But I believe that we can, because if I'm going to come before you and say the white man is oppressing us and there's nothing we can do until he changes, I'm admitting that I'm the white man's inferior. Because if I can't stop him from doing what he's doing to me, that naturally means he's a better man than I am. And I'm never going to do are where we are because we choose to stay there. And the minute we make up our mind that we're tired of being on the bottom, we'll go to the top. As your Bible says, the last shot is first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's come out over here one time. And we're going to be back to you, brother, and then Do you think it's possible for a black man to have a white wife and still be down for the black right struggle? Absolutely not. You are a living contradiction. And why do you think black men love white women? Because black men want to be white men themselves. And the closest I can come to my approximation of whiteness is to lay down with the woman who's the crown jewel of the white man's eye. Any black man with a white woman is a black man who really wishes to the white man himself. Black wings forever. Nobody's never. I got an opportunity to talk to Derek Johnson of the NAACP and I asked him this question. No, NAACP is pro white Jews. What he told me was that he was pushing the jury for him. Do you know that? My question is this. Why is the NAACP ineffective in its efforts, and why hasn't the George Floyd bill been passed? The NAACP, the NAACP was founded by white Jews, Jews. including Mary White Overton, who didn't even like black people. So they could put us out front, do all the fighting for the civil rights, and then the European Jews would come and cherry pick the gains that black people died for. The whole purpose of the NAACP is to control how much progress you make. And this is why we as black people should never get comfortable letting white people finance our organizations. You can't name me a single black organization financed by white people that has ever done any real good for black America. Al Sharpton is compromised because he takes money from white people. Jesse Jackson was compromised because he takes money from white people. I don't really question Jesse now because he's up in age, he's retired. But when he was in his prime, Rainbow Coalition took money from whites. NAACP takes money from whites. Black politicians takes money from whites. One of the reasons I accepted no money and I can't pay the bill for Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy because when we open up that school, if white people help me to open that school, then I can't claim this as a black victim. You understand what I'm saying? If white people gave me the money to open up that school, how is it a black school? This is why Marcus Garvey said, and we as Pan-Africanists believe, anything that is to be done for black people must be done by black people, by ourselves. No white money, no white membership. Everything all black. I want to, first of all, speak on, uh, ask about Christ. Christ is a conscience that... Christ, okay, brother. Brother, it was Christ is a conscience. 
that, that really taps into the source. You know what I'm saying? That Christ is conscious. And, and, and Jesus is the, the, the last thing. That, the, the U.S. Is, a, is the prefix of Zeus. Of Zeus and how Zeus comes. Spanish slavery. So now I, I have uh, three questions to ask you, brother. One's quick. Brothers, if you're in the community that you live in, the community that you live in, community, so, 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 and it's real quick. So, how, so, how do you feel? So, when do we come teaching economics and uh, black women? I mean, women, we need to learn, you know, I'm just teaching myself, we have no one else to teach us. To teach us, to, to, to almost never have people don't know about gentrification and why the Arabic, the, the Arabs, which was the first to enslave blacks. Before the Christians, they call Mediterranean Europeans. When, they, when do we, I mean, when, how do we get back to Africa? Where do we go to Africa? Where does the money come from? And what about the weaponry and the casualties? Well, how do you feel about that? But to get there. And how do you feel about uh, the militia? Gang gang. Like, where the guns at? Where the guns at? Well, how we going to get there, baby? We all in the same hood you in, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm putting in more work then. Come on, bro. I got you. You, you feel the sentiment and that's the answer right here? Ain't no more him, ain't no more him. Oh, I think. Right on. Man, you want me hey, brother, Umar, okay. let me tell you what. When brother came here, he said, hey, man, brother Umar, like, this brother's Michael Jordan, so well, forgive his passion. Well, I'm, I'm the only one that uh, holler at these Arabs like we'll leave them change. No, right. We'll leave them change feeling good when we get some change, but they'll look at us crazy to uh, we own a penny in the store. So like when do we come together? When do we stop letting like our elders get like we, we need help, man. We need help. Because you're gonna leave. And we're gonna still be in the same problem. And I'm out here with you. I'm, I'm whatever. And I'm trying to educate, educate. I'm going to school to educate, not teach, to educate. I want to know. Alright, answer the question best you can, brother Umar. Education and economics is where we need to start. You can start a credit union with less than $100,000. You can start a credit union with less than $100,000. Y'all spend more money on Christmas gifts than $100,000 just in Lansing. We have to put our money together so we can finance each other's businesses. This is what the Mexicans do. This is what the Arabs do. Take everybody in this gym. You put in $200 a month. He get his first business, she get his first business. They open it up. They now have to put 20% of their income back into that credit union. Now he get his business. We still put $200 in a month. The interest is growing. Within five years, everybody in there got their own business. We have to start a credit union. Education and economics. Education, we got to prepare the children for liberation. Without education, there will be no transformation. The brother talked about a military. We do need a military, but guess what? The worst thing you can do is start a military with people who are politically uneducated. As the great Pan-Africanist Thomas Sankara said in Burkina Faso, a politically uneducated soldier, soldier is a traitor waiting to happen. We have to educate our people so they know what they're fighting for. But to give them a gun without political education, they will turn the gun on their own people. Education before militarization. Who we got next? Right here. Right here. Hi, Dr. Umar. Uh, my name is Mavis Rogers. I have a question because I'm a first generation African immigrant in here. What country? Uh, Ghana. Uh. Yes. Uh, I was born in Accra and I'm here, I was, here, I was brought here about eight years old um, uh. and I've been to school here. My question is how does someone like me who might have uh, property and so, and so forth and family in Ghana connect my life here and kind of bridge that gap and involve my Africanness with my Americanness while also helping my community. You have to, we have to build a village in Ghana for Africans in the Western Hemisphere. Not just America, Canada, Brazil, Caribbean, to come back home and experience Africa so they know that this is home. How do I start that? For me, specifically me, I have bought land, I've started building a building. I, I'm not sure exactly yet what I want it to be, but I feel so isolated. I feel like I don't have help, I feel like I don't. Well, I tell you this, I'll give you an idea right now. 
Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. We should be opening our doors next September the 3rd of 2024. We would love to do an exchange program with you in Ghana, where we send our kids over there, possibly learn some agriculture, learn some African culture itself, yes. and some other things so you can partner with us. Yes. We would love you. <laughs> Garvey. Garvey Day, Doctor Garvey Day, brother. My first question is: On social media, I saw that there was a property broken at the FDG Academy in Wilmington, Delaware. Yeah, somebody broke the window last week. I think I know who it was. One of my coons. How do you plan on like security for the students and the staff members upcoming 2024? I can't answer that publicly or to give the plan away, but we do have a security plan. Okay, awesome. And then my second question regards like organization. Clearly we're novices and amateurs at that as a people. What qualities would you suggest that uh, startup organizations would do to help our people? The qualities for the individual? Yes. Okay, five things that you want to see in anybody who claims to be serious about the revolution. Number one is humility. Number one is humility. I don't care how many degrees you got. I don't care how much knowledge you got. I don't care how much experience you got. If you are not humble enough to hear other people out, one of our big issues is our ego. The ego of the Negro has been one of the greatest hindrances to the progress of our people. Humility. The first thing I look for is humility, even from me. Because if I can't sit down with the people and be amongst the people, I'm useless to the people. Right? That European consciousness that the white man gave us has convinced us that we have all the answers and nobody else don't. We got to have humility. After the humility, courage. Are you willing to speak truth to power? Can you stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the white power structure? Creativity. Do you have fresh ideas we can use? Consistency. Do you live what you claim you stand for? Or are you changing your political philosophy to suit your financial agenda? Right? Right. Consciousness, how alert, educated, and aware you are of who we are and where we are. You can't have a dumb soldier, right? So you need creativity, consistency, consciousness, commitment. Are you willing to die for this? Are you willing to go to jail for this? Are you willing to go homeless for this? Because one thing we gotta understand, everybody in this auditorium has a different level of sacrifice they're willing to make. She might be willing to lose her job, but she might not be willing to go to jail. You might be willing to go to jail, but you might not be willing to die. He might be willing to die. Does that mean y'all can't be a part of the struggle? No, y'all can all be a part of the struggle, but be honest about what you're willing to sacrifice. If you're only willing to go to jail, say that. Then I know where to put you. You willing to die? I know where to put you. You willing to lose your child, but you don't want to go to jail? I know where to put you. The problem with the black liberation struggle is everybody show up saying they're willing to die, when the truth of the matter is they are not. Be honest about what you're willing to sacrifice. Get in where you fit in so we know where to use you. We can use everybody, but be honest about what you're willing to sacrifice. Thank you. How you doing, Dr. Um, my sister, I got a question. My sister, she lived out in Texas. She got two boys. She wanted to go to the Senior Academy, but she's not able to relocate. She want to know how can she go about doing that. And also, um, if you think obtaining reparations is realistic, and if so, should we temporarily redirect our focus as blacks on the national goal instead of our matters such as global pan-African unity? Okay. Let me answer the first question. He said, what if you have a son who can't move to Wilmington, Delaware? How does he benefit from FBMG? Two ways. Number one, we will have a virtual academy for black boys. So even if you can't physically be there, you can tap in through the internet and be in the class. You can see your classmates, your classmates can see you, but that will not be the first year of operation. That's about year two or three, right? So that's number one. Second answer, even if your son is not a student at FDMG, he can still participate in our manhood training programs. When we go to Africa, he can come. When we go hiking, he can come. When we go fishing, when we go hunting, when we do our sleepovers, when we go paintballing, gun training, he can come. You follow me? So even if he can't be a Monday through Friday warrior, he can be a weekend warrior with FDMG. What y'all need to do, well, y'all got good news because y'all only an hour from the Detroit airport. And Detroit to Philly is a one hour flight. And the front door to Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is a 20 minute ride from the Philadelphia airport. So you go an hour from Lansing to Detroit, you fly an hour from Detroit to Philly, and then you drive 20 minutes from the Philly airport to the FDMG front door. So y'all only two hours and 20 minutes away. Y'all could be at the school a whole lot. 
And I look to see y'all there as well. Because outside of the school, we're going to have programs for the whole community. Black Women's Conference, Black Men's Conference, Black Youth Conference, Ex-Offenders Conference, Black Wall Street Conference, Black Investor Conference, Black Farmers Conference, Black Media Conference. It's going to be a conference for everything. So even though we got the school for the children, but we got the community center for the whole race. So all y'all going to be spending a lot of time in FDMG Delaware. We're going to be having our grand opening for the community this summer. Please stay on my social media. You have my number. You can text me. It's going to be in August or September, a grand opening for the community for y'all to come down, eat some food, politics, see the school, socialize and network, and I want to see all of y'all there. But you have to be a donor in order to come to the grand opening. If you haven't donated in nine years, you better hit your cash app or your PayPal or you're not coming to heaven. You understand? <laughs> y'all done took your Chinese and Arabs and East Indians and y'all done financed everybody else. You better help us finance the school for black people. Second question. He said, is it better to focus on a domestic agenda versus Pan-Africanism? You do both. I don't know why black people got this idea, I gotta be a Pan-Africanist, right? Or I gotta be a domestic activist. You do both. <laughs> you do both. You have to make Africa free or you will never be. But at the same time, we gotta address the problems in Michigan. We gotta address the problems in Lansing and Kalamazoo. It's not either or. You do both. Fight to free Africa and fight to empower Black Lansing. You do both at the same time. No struggle is one dimension. As Africa goes, so goes all African people. Last question. Last question. Right here, Doctor. Right here, Doctor. Right here, right here. Right here. Yes, sir. <coughs> Dr. Humar, I am the brother that owns the door and lock company, the glass company. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Well, my question to you is, brother. I got a broke window, brother. Well, I got you covered. I got you covered. I came halfway across the world this morning to come here. Appreciate you. My question is, I was born and raised in Detroit. How do I convince my other black business owners like myself that this movement is worth our, our everything? Because most of my partners that own businesses like myself and all the different industries are so indoctrinated with the white banking industry and also with the culture here where you have to get into one of these white programs to get any money donated to your business so you can do community work. How can we get them un completely dis from that and get into an economic power of our own banking, our own system. I need to convince other people my age that own businesses like me that this, not only this, your school, but other programs like this, because it's going to grow, and we can do this on our own. I have to be able to have that conversation with them honestly and say this will work without them saying, well, if I go and I promote what we're promoting, the white bank is going to cut me off totally because it doesn't look good in the meetings. We have to spend a lot of money to go to their meetings. We have to fund their breakfasts. We have to fund their dinners. We have to go to the athletic club. We have to go to this. All their political agendas. If you can't get a ticket, you have to buy a $500 ticket in, or they won't even talk to you about your application to even think about going you through all the paperwork to give you any money. I'm tired of going through the hoops and the loops to get money that we can't even use for our own communities. What is the plan for that? I need to be able to have some ammunition to talk to my brothers outside of that industry one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, this will work. Great question. One of the most powerful things that Booker T. Washington did was when he built the National Negro Business League and he made the black businesses work together and work with one another. Biggest problem we have is black businesses, we don't support each other. If you got 10 people in here in the business, they should have a United Black Business Club. If I spend a dollar with him at his barber shop, I'll automatically get a discount at her tire shop. I spend a dollar at that tire shop, I'll automatically get a discount at her bakery. I spend a dollar at that bakery, I'll automatically get a discount at your supermarket. Black businesses are not supporting each other. They should be handing off customers the way we hand off a baton and attract meat. The issue with black business is you got black capitalists and you got black nationalists. We can't do nothing with the capitalists. All they care about is money. They don't give a damn about the future of black people. We got to get those black activists and those black nationalists. And just like Booker T. Washington, create that National Negro Business League. If that's something you're going to be working on, let me know. I'm all for that.
I'm all for that. There's no way in hell the black hair salons and barbershops should have let the Koreans take over the, the hair care business. The only way the Koreans took over the hair care business in the black community is we was too busy fighting with each other, competing with each other, this beauty salon trying to outdo this beauty salon, yep. this barbershop trying to outdo this barbershop, and the Koreans ran away with the whole damn industry. We have to unite or we will be destroyed. I don't know if you heard about this yet, Baba. I don't know if the rest of y'all heard about this either. There is a national movement to destroy black restaurants. What a lot of these uh, landlords are doing, let's say you had a black soul food joint in Lansing. You were paying $3,000 for rent for the past 10 years. All of a sudden, your Arab landlord said, I can't afford to let you pay $3,000. You now gotta pay $7,000. And so a black soul food restaurant that's been in business for 34 years gotta pack up and close shop. This is happening all over America. I think it's a concerted effort to destroy black restaurants so we completely dependent on non-Africans for our food. Harold's in Chicago. Another one. Yep, and yep. then there's another one in New York. Yep. They are systematically shutting them down by raising the rent. But here's the issue. How you been in business 30 years? No home. No home. No home. So that's where we got to come in at. 30 years? You should have had three of them joints. That's right. That you own. So we got to do better. We got to get into real estate. That's another thing. For those of y'all who got children in high school, do not send them to college unless you can answer three questions. Number one, did you raise them with the discipline to finish college? Number two, are they going to major in something relevant? Number three, are you sure that whatever your child is majoring in, they're going to be able to make a contribution to the black community because of it? Too many black kids are going into long-term debt to America's banks in the name of college. Too many student loans. Most of us own student loans, and half of us don't even work in the area where we got our education in. If I was you, I would send my son and my daughter to one of these technical colleges where they will go for two years, two years, licensed plumber, two years, licensed electrician, two years, licensed roofer, two years, licensed welder, two years, licensed auto mechanic, two years, and they could be making more money than a surgeon. You know what we had to pay our electricians? Over $150,000 for those electrical repairs. That's more money in one week than a lawyer might make in a whole year. We need the skills that pay the bills. Make sure your son and daughters got skills that pay the bills. Don't send them to college unless they're going to major in something relevant. But if it was up to me, they go to trade school first for two years, get a license. If you want to go to college after you get a license, you can pay your own way through college now. Mm -hmm. Put them in trade school. Uh -huh. This is my question. Uh, when we come to programs like this, often we talk about community building or we talk about educating people. The Panthers talked about their programs is based on survival and revolution, right? All of their programs, schools, medical, whatever they were doing, was meant that we immediately had to survive. But the ultimate goal was revolution. When I come to programs like this, it don't seem like I hear people telling people that ultimately we're going to have to fight. And that the programs and things that we build are designed to put us in a position to fight. That these schools aren't going to solve our problems either. Or trying to come together. Because that bank is still controlled by the Federal Reserve and all the banking regulations. That's my question. At what point do we tell people that the programs that we are creating are meant to survive immediately, but ultimately they're to put us in a position? where we can fight because no people on earth have ever got anywhere from just trying to build within the system. The goal has always been to fight. Reparations, what was taken from us was power, not money. Reparations ultimately to me mean land because from the land we get our power and resources. So that's what I'm saying about reparations. What we lost was power. But oh, power the was not money. So reparations got to be in yeah. power in some aspect. Great question. Two answers on that. I agree with you. But here's where I want to exercise caution. Military struggle, armed combat is the last stage of revolution. It's not the first. I'm not interested in dying with nobody who couldn't help me build anything. The problem with us sometimes, we're too quick to want to fight, but we never in a rush to create anything for ourselves. Are y'all following where I'm coming from? We always want to talk, we always want to debate, we want to fight. When do we build? Look at all the riots we had. Look at all the police rebellions we had. We'll show up to burn it down, but we won't show up the next day to build it back up. 
I'm only interested in fighting with people who are also willing to build. Because what I know, there's a lot of African people who are so consumed with anger and so consumed with hurt that all they want to do is inflict damage on somebody. And after they get done fighting the white man, they are still filled with anger, so now they want to turn around and fight their own brother and sister as well. It happened in Africa. So we can't be in a rush to fight. Let's be in a rush to build. So when we do fight, we have something to defend. I do agree with you. There will come a time when we have to defend ourselves, but you gotta build in the meantime. You don't know who you can trust in here. I don't know who I can trust in here. I bet you there's at least three FBI agents in here right now, <laughs> right? I want to bet there's about three snitches for the black bourgeoisie who sent them to see if I was gonna talk about them. You understand me? You got about three undercover police in here. You understand? I'm just being honest. And then the black church sent a bunch of coons too to report back. So until I get to know you, how do I line up and put my life in your hands and you put your life in my hands? We got to be in the trenches first and we need to be in the trenches building something. You know what hurts me? I travel the whole country. I ain't been to a black community in America yet that has its own black Wall Street. No city in this country do black people have their own school, their own bank, their own hospital, their own supermarket. 50 million Africans in America. 50 states, $2 trillion. We're the richest blacks in the world. We're the 10th richest nation on earth. And we ain't got a single community where we control the major institutions. That is a psychological holocaust. And I support reparations, but guess what? Before we can talk external reparations, we need to have internal reparations. What am I talking about? Most of the problems that have to be solved for black people, money cannot fix them. That's money right. cannot make the black man respect the black woman. Right. Money cannot make the black woman respect the black man. Money cannot make the black community stop worshiping a white Jesus. Money is not going to teach us to exercise patience with one another. If you give us reparations before we have built an infrastructure to track that wealth inside of it, all black reparations will go right back to white people and not Africans. If they gave everybody in here a million dollars, these non-African businesses in Lansing could be a million dollars richer tomorrow. Yes. Which is why I do not support a cash payout for reparations as a priority. If you were to put it at the bottom of the list, I'll tolerate it. But to make that the priority clearly tells me we are not thinking deep enough and we are not thinking visionarily enough. We, excuse me, we should be getting all the land back that was stolen from our ancestors from 1865 to 1965. We should be getting control of all black music, all black inventions. You understand? We should be getting control of certain major ports. 60% of all black people in America are concentrated in 10 states, and your state happens to be one of them. Michigan. All of them are on the water. You guys are on the Great Lake. We should be controlling the major port. We get paid anytime something comes in, anytime something goes out. We have to get into global distribution. Black people in America spend too much money for us not to be involved in global distribution. The Honorable Marcus Garvey is the only leader we ever had who tried to get us into global distribution with the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation, but he was sabotaged by W.E.B. Du Bois and other jealous black leaders. We have to get into distribution. We make we spend too much money not to be making them back. The mayor of Jackson. Yes, sir. He's the first to bring me to Jackson. His son is the mayor now. I'll be in Jackson next week for the water crisis drop. I think they murdered Chokwe. They murdered him. He went to the hospital. He was fine. They murdered Chokwe. They murdered him. I have no doubt about that. If you are an activist in Lansing, this goes for all y'all who do community work. If you got to go to the hospital, take all your ID off you. Do not go into the hospital with any ID and give them a fake name. Because the FBI database is tied to every hospital's database. When a revolutionary checks into the hospital, the FBI automatically gets an alert. And they can tell that doctor to make sure you don't make it out of the hospital. Remember, Tupac showed up alive at the hospital. Right. Shukwe showed up alive. I can name you millions of black people who showed up alive at the hospital, didn't make it out of the hospital. Mm. If I got to go to the emergency room, my name is not Umar Johnson, it's John Brown. 